you are sitting in the heavenly realms with Jesus Christ and everything is under his feet is under your feet. Other day I, I was driving and I am in this deep stress over a subject, over a person that I could not change and I could not do anything about the circumstance. Prayed, talked, reason, everything humbled, everything, everything, everything possible. But I could not do any, I couldn't change anything. And I'm driving and I am like, and I love this person so much, so much. It hurts me. It hurts me when people self-sabotage. It hurts me when people abort, abort their babies in the spirit realm. It hurts me how much there's self-hatred in a person to just to destroy a destiny. Just, it hurts me to see. It looks like the devil wins, but it is not true, of course, but it hurts me. And at that very moment, driving, and I said, help me, Father. This is all I said. Help me, Father. You see, and he told me this, I'm going to tell you. He said, I was waiting for you to say that. Because I was, sometimes we overthink so much, we think so much, and we don't ask help. And we don't ha ask help from people, we don't ask help from Jesus. We don't ask help from the Father. And I just said, help me. And I didn't know what, how can he help in this situation, because you know, this, if God cannot change someone, you can't change someone. And there are people, you know, the answer to a question, can God do anything? He cannot do anything. God cannot do everything he wants. He cannot do anything unholy. He cannot, God cannot do evil. God can, he doesn't have sin in him. You've got to understand, there are things God cannot do. He cannot partner with the devil. He cannot do things. And there are, there are times God cannot change a person. God cannot deliver a person from their demons. Why? Because self-will is very powerful. God doesn't violate his plan. God doesn't violate the right that he gave us. He doesn't violate. Because if he could change everybody, then we will be all like robots. He doesn't go and violate our, our will. He's respectful to our will. And he said to me, if, you, if I cannot change this person, how, why are you striving so hard to change this person? But he said, I am glad you asked my help. Now I am going to change your heart towards the situation. Are you giving me a permission to change your heart? And I said, yes, Lord, I am giving you a permission to change my heart. And he changed my heart. When we say, Father, help me, we don't know which way he's going to help us. You see? We, we really don't know how, how it's going to play. Because when we say, help me, he has a way... I have a scenario in my mind for this person to come into repentance, right? But he has a bigger scenario written already in the book of the person and my book. And we need to understand when we say, help me, he's going to help different ways to us. Not the way that we project and we set our minds to help. His help to us. Otherwise, he would be a maid helper, cleaning lady. He wouldn't be God. His helper is, God is my helper, when David said, it's a very high position helper. We need to understand the difference. Sometimes we want God to work for us. 
he works on our behalf, but he's not my employee. And I, when I said, Father, help me, he helped me. He didn't only change the circumstance, but he brought the upgrade to the circumstance. He upgraded my circumstance. He's gonna, his, his solution is always an upgrade. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. And he drew a greater standard. There is one greater than the law of Moses here. There is one greater than the temple is here. There is one greater than the Solomon here is here. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than the greater. So he's, he's going to always bring upgrade when we say help me. And then he said, tell my children they are not saying this to me enough. So can we just stop right now? And there are things in your life, in your personality, in your family. We all need a miracle. God bless you. Can you just say, help me, Father? And think of that thing, whatever it is. Or maybe three things or five things. Just say, help me, Father. And he knows already. Help is on the way. Amen? Help me, Father. We are talking about kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. Uh, we, we are in the DNA Jesus series this year. We just moved to a new building. Uh, you know, we, uh, everything is starting all over after the pandemic. And God is giving us an upgrade as a church. Everything is... He's changing and transforming and upgrading. We are in a transition season, you know, as a baby church. Came here and just, we started putting our tent packs and started putting our tent here. And he started sending us upgrade people, great people, great anointed people, new, completely brand new structure he started establishing among us. And he asked me, for those that are new, he said, I want you to preach Jesus, only my name, because I don't want to be disappearing from the church. There is so much into success, so much into Western gospel, so much into prosperity, so much into power, personal, self-righteous, self-ambitious, selfish, ambitious power. And I want you to bring me to the center of the picture. It's all about me. It's all about Jesus. It's all, all, all about Jesus Christ. And we started this series and uh, we started Life of Jesus and we started doing uh, communication style of Jesus. And all these things, everything I do is being translated to more than uh, six, seven languages for 200 nations. And so he said to me now, start the parables of Jesus. And this is parables part two uh, about the kingdom of heaven. Now we're going to go through all the parables about the kingdom of heaven because if you understand the concept of kingdom of heaven, you operate in that authority because the moment our salvation starts, the moment we say yes to Jesus Christ, the moment... We receive Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That light switch is turned on and we are connected to heaven and to our authority as children of God. And if we don't operate in the heavenly realm, we are operating in the, on the earthly realm, which most of Christians operate. And that is why they are pathetic in their lives until they go to heaven. We don't have to be pathetic. But we have to be so powerful in Jesus Christ when we know our positional authority. And that is why these series are for, because once we understand, and how many of you know that the world needs us? The world needs us. Why? Because we carry Christ and the world needs us. And before this service, I prayed and I, we were praying in our prayer time, I prayed that God will give us Christ's compassion. 
Because church doesn't have compassion anymore. We don't. We are only thinking ourselves, our selfish gain. We are not thinking about the kingdom. And so through these parables, I want to invest in you kingdomly thinking, kingdom mentality. So once you have the kingdom mentality, you walk. So many deliverance ministers are unsuccessful. Why? They are still operating from the earthly realm. They are not operating in the heavenly realm, heavenly kingdom realm. So once you start knowing this kingdom perspective, you're going to look at things differently. And all those stuff that look so big is going to be under your feet. You're going to command hurricanes and tornadoes. You're going to start speaking different languages. Listen, you're going to start speaking different languages that you could never speak. You're going to start playing instruments that you have never played. You're going to have creativity of heaven because there's heaven on earth. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There's no lack in heaven. But it's not only money. There are things that money cannot buy. Money cannot teach you how to play piano concert level. Money cannot teach you Chinese fluently. There are things money, money cannot buy. But when kingdom comes, kingdom of God comes upon us, there will be things we will be doing that we are going to be shocked. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 20, 1 through 16, the Passion Translation. This will help you understand the way heaven's kingdom operates. Jesus is speaking. This will help you understand the way heaven's kingdom operates. There once was a wealthy landowner who went out at daybreak to hire all the laborers he could find to work in his vineyard. After agreeing to pay them the standard day's wage, he put them to work. Then at nine o'clock, as he was passing through the town square, he found others standing around without work. He told them, come and work for me in my vineyard, and I will pay you a fair wage. So off they went to join the others. He did the same thing at noon and again three o'clock, making the same arrangement as he did with others. Hoping to finish his harvest day, that day, he went to the town square again at five o'clock and found more who were idle. So he said to them, why have you been here all day without work? Because no one hired us. They answered. So he said to them, then go and join my crew and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard went to his foreman and said, call in all the laborers, line them up, and pay them the same wages. Starting with the most recent ones, I hired and finishing with the ones who work all day. When those hired late in the day came to be paid, they were given a full day's wage. And when those who had been hired first came to be paid, they were convinced that they would receive more. But everyone was paid the standard wage. When they realized what had happened, they were offended and complained to the landowner, saying, you are treating us unfairly. They have only worked for one hour while we have labored and sweated all day under the scorching sun. You have made them equal to us. The landowner replied, friends, I am not being unfair. I am doing exactly what I said. Didn't you agree to work for the standard wage? 
If I want to give those who only work for an hour equal pay, what does that matter to you? Don't I have the right to do what I want with what is mine? Why should my generosity make you jealous of them? Now you can understand what I meant when I said that the first will end up last, the last will end up being first. Everyone is invited, but few are the chosen. Amen? Okay, let's look at the storyline right now. First of all, Jesus is saying this will help you understand the way heaven's kingdom operates. Heaven's kingdom operates a certain way, obviously, because he's teaching us right now. Heaven's kingdom operates differently than the earth's kingdom, okay? you got to understand, Jesus also said, prostitutes and tax collectors will be going ahead of you to the kingdom of God. Who did he say those things? To so the Pharisees, religious leaders, okay? Who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved? Whether in their last breath, like the thieves on the cross, or whether someone that has been working at the church for 30 years and saved for 40 years. God is not looking at things like this. Why? First of all, we got to understand this. Number one, what is happening here is so little comparison to the eternity. There's eternity. There's eternity. How, how long is eternity? How many years is eternity? Forever. You live here 100 years, the max 105 years, whatever. 91 is here. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord for 91 years. Happy birthday. After 90 years old, we need to sing you happy birthday every day. You know? But seriously, after 100 years, what is 100 years comparison to 100 trillion years multiplied by 100 trillion years multiplied by 100 trillion years? Nothing. So you see, these are calculators, small calculators. People calculate. You're going to look at calculators. I don't like calculators. I don't like real calculators. I, I'm telling you, until I came to America, I never used a calculator in my life. No. I was prohibited to, my father said, you can never use a calculator. If it was five digits multiplied by five different digits, I, had, I, I couldn't do it everything by mind. I could take pen and paper. I had to do it. I, and my father was an, is an economist, like bigger than CPA. He could calculate in everything in his mind, almost like to an autistic level. And I had the little part of that, and I could calculate a lot of things, even the percentages and everything. So it was hard for me when I came here. I didn't know how to use a calculator. And everybody was calculating the smallest stuff because I knew the multiplications up, up to 20, 25 by heart. So it is, but I don't like the calculators and these guys are calculators. So let's, let's break it down. There was once a wealthy landowner. He was wealthy, okay? There is little being wealthy and so what is the opposite of wealthy? Poor. No, poor is opposite of rich. Wealthy and poverty. I, I, I want to put it like this. Wealth and poverty, like two, two opposites, right? But this guy was wealthy. How do we know that he was wealthy? I know people who are wealthy because they are generous. Hmm. If somebody is not generous and they have money, they are not wealthy. They are stingy, okay? So this guy was a generous guy. He was a wealthy, like... Stingy people are poor people. It doesn't matter how many millions of dollars they have because it's never enough. They operate in the poverty spirit. There once was a wealthy, he was wealthy, who went out at daybreak, but if you go a little further, hoping to finish his harvest that day. Okay, he was wealthy and he had a harvest to finish. He had an assignment and he had a goal. Okay, so that is why he's hiring people. He's gathering people. 
This is what we are doing as a church. When you know that your work is to collect the harvest, Jesus, what did Jesus said, harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You know, we have our, I have an international ministry and international ministry uh, to the, a lot of nations and people come and they want to partner with us and they want to say, I want to give your ministry money, big amounts of money. And what do you need? You know what we always need? Harvesters. We need follow-up people. We, not, we need disciple people. We always pay them. You know, we don't, do, we don't do much volunteer stuff. You know, this volunteer thing is in America. Everybody needs to put bread on the table. And this is related to my message. Everybody, everybody needs to work and bring their wages to the table. You know, when I started international ministry, they said, you're going to find volunteers in Turkey to help with your follow-up. And I said, do you pay them? Because I am coming from corporate world. We pay everybody. Nobody was volunteering in my corporate business. You know, everybody was getting paycheck. Why those people in Turkey, in the Middle East, in Egypt, poor people, poorer than here, they cannot buy bread and they need to volunteer. So you can do fundraising with the numbers that I am giving. With my testimony, people were writing hundreds of thousands of dollars check. It wasn't going to my ministry. But you got to understand the concept. And I said, how long a volunteer lasts? You guys have been doing this. So the CEO came. You know, I was a host at that time. Maybe hostage, but I was a host. And, but, but this person... Yeah, some people in the Middle East, they cannot pronounce everything. They call me hostage when they introduce me. And they cannot say pastor. Instead of P, they use the B. And then it was a mess. And so, yeah. But I am used to, I am not offended when people mess up with their accent. So, and, and then I ask them, how long approximately a volunteer works? You know, tell me, give me. They say volunteers usually work three to six months. They don't last. I say, have you ever thought why they don't last? They said, why? I'm like, are you kidding me? You have been doing this for over, you know, so many years, 50 years, and you don't know why volunteers don't last because you don't pay them. I said, I don't want volunteers. I want employees. I want people to make money and bring to their family because I want to bless those who want to bless the ministry. And do you know, uh, I started TV ministry 14 years ago. My follow-up team is the same for 14 years. Wow. Why? Because they get paid. I'm not going to be working from their back and making money and they are not going to make anything. That's not godly. So this man was wealthy, but he was a godly man. And he started collecting the harvesters. This is how I see it. I am paying to the harvesters. You know, those harvesters are going to come and help, right? And sometimes you work at the church, but it's not volunteering. It's a missionary work. you got to understand the difference. When I see you guys here, you are missionaries. You are not. I, I don't like to call them volunteers. You, you guys are missionaries. You want to be a missionary? You do it. You come and you reach out. They're just completely different. And what happens is he wants to, to finish the harvest day, and he, he, he didn't have enough people. So he's going to keep going to the same place and hiring people. Hiring people is still the same. There are so many hungry people, and there are so many ungrateful people that are working for the jobs that they hate, right? The moment they leave, we, we find like two dozen people. Why? People are hungry out there, and they don't have the luxury to quit or do anything because, because they, it's an option for them. And this guy goes and picks up some people in the morning to work for them, and they are working all day. Some he picks them up during the lunchtime, and then he goes in the afternoon. But there are some people that at 5 o'clock he goes and he picks them up. So how is this relevant to today? There are some people, they are born into a Christian family. And now you ask them, when is your birthday in Jesus? They don't know. Oh, that is very interesting. I know my birthday in Jesus, right? You are born into a Christian home, but you still need to know when you 
have a relationship with Jesus Christ started. Otherwise, it's a religion. You need to know. At least something significantly happened in your heart. You've got to know. So some people are saying here, wow, you know, they are Christians for all their lives. They were born in a Christian home. Everybody was reading the Bible. They know the word of God since birth. I wasn't, I wasn't church. I was a radical Muslim. I was reading Quran every day. I memorized Quran, at least some part of it by now. I still have more memorized Quran in me than the Bible. Why? Because it is from birth to 28 years old, I was brainwashed with Quran. But word of God is so powerful, he overpowered and overcame every lie of the enemy in my mind and in my soul. So you got to understand. So these people, some of them are 40 years in the Lord. Why? Because they were born in a Christian home. And some of them, their aunts or their cousins brought them to church. They got saved at 10 years old. Some of them are late. They came to Christ because they were living in a country that is there is a freedom of religion, at least for now. And very short period of time. And we left, left for us. So what is happening here right now? And then these people who are prostitutes and who are, uh, you know, sold to sex slavery, drug dealers, drug addicts, they are coming. They are coming to faith. And those people, 40 years, 50 years, grew up in the Christian homes, they are saying, wait a minute, this is not right. I have been serving Jesus in the church for 50 years, and this bum walks into the church. He stole, he killed, he did every kind of, he violated Ten Commandments, and you are telling him he can't go to heaven. This is not right. This is exactly what is happening here in this parable. Pharisees are coming, religious people are coming, and they want to prevent people that are so screwed up going to heaven. It is the same today. This is not no different. I want to tell you. It's not different. My husband and I, uh, he still goes. It, 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 you, you all know, where is Pastor Rick? He's in jail. <laughs> He's in jail every week. And in, in our house, we ask, you know, my daughter says, where is dad? He's in jail. And she's like, again? You know, what did he do this time? But so this, this is a thing. He goes all the time. But we were going together when we were in Florida. And we, had this, we started this all ministry, street ministry, because we like to uh, hang out with prostitutes and pimps and drug dealers and drug addicts on the street more than with church people. I want to tell you, some of them are more trustworthy than the church people. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I am so happy that you are here. And my mission in life is for you to fulfill your potential that God created you to be. So if you can share my videos and comment, like, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for being here today. We are sitting in the heavenly realms with Jesus Christ and everything is under his feet is under your feet.